Well, good evening, and uh, can I offer everyone a very warm welcome to uh, this, our fourth in our Ultimate Questions series. I've been told that if I stand this close to the lectern, the colour isn't quite as bad, but there we go. Very warm welcome. Let me pray for us, and, uh, oh, and then I'll explain. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can uh, get together and uh, hear from your words. Please teach us now. Uh, bless us as we have a look at this. Um, help us to know ourselves and know Christ better. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going through this little booklet. It's called Ultimate Questions. Uh, it's a, a simple explanation of the gospel. And uh, we're really just raiding it for headings uh, to structure our series and, uh, and, and raiding it for a few other ideas as well. Uh, this is chapter four, uh, Who Am I? And uh, we're going to start with uh, this picture on the screen. It's uh, what Paul Gauguin considered his masterpiece, uh, the grand culmination of his thoughts. He said, I believe that this canvas uh, not only surpasses all my preceding ones, but that I shall never do anything better or even like it. So certainly not with that attitude, but that's, uh, that's what he said. It's called, where do we come from? Where are, what are we? Where are we going? And you're supposed to read the picture from uh, right to left. So over on the right, there's uh, some women uh, sitting on the floor there with a little baby, uh, symbolizing where we've come from uh, and the start of life. Um, there in the middle, we've got some figures that are meant to signify uh, kind of everyday happenings of, of life. And then over on the left, we've got somebody uh, quite elderly sitting on the floor, uh, signifying the end of life. There's a, a white bird on the floor by, uh, by his feet, uh, which is meant to represent the futility of language, that words can't express uh, anything meaningful. And then behind the elderly person, you've got this blue idol that's meant to signify the great beyond and uh, uh, beyond death, the mystery. And Gauguin had felt that this was all he could say. This picture was it. And uh, he planned to kill himself upon finishing it and did take a, an overdose of arsenic, but survived to live another five years. I was going to use uh, these three questions as my headings tonight, but they, they can't really be separated, can they? Um, what are we? Rather depends on your answer to where do we come from and vice versa. Um, and uh, dictates the answer to where are we going? Uh, they are the most basic questions we could ask. And everything about our society assumes an answer to these questions that, in general, it no longer believes. Um, so for the sake of time and simplicity, I'm going to consider two main answers to those questions, uh, and both very briefly. So if you've got questions, please do grab them, and there will be plenty of ground that I've left uncovered. So uh, there'll be a chance for, for asking those questions in a moment. Uh, but we're going to consider two main answers, that of the Bible, and that of materialism. And uh, obviously, these aren't the only two views. Uh, but in the West, I think they're the main two. And many people's ideas are a mixture of these two mutually contradictory views. Uh, we cannot have them both. We must choose. Now, here in the West, we assume that human beings are precious. If you believe in nothing else, you must believe in human rights. We believe that our rights and dignity are to be respected, that human beings should be loved and protected, and, have, and that we have enormous potential to love, provide, worship, create, to take responsibility. These convictions uh, were built on the belief that all men and women were created by God in his own image, that we will face his wrath should we in any way desecrate his reflection in them. So we're going to start with a reading from Psalm 8. It'll be uh, on a video on the screen. And uh, it's a, a psalm that expresses this precious view of what humanity is. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. 
you have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. What is man that you are mindful of him, says uh, the psalmist. As uh, John Calvin said, humanity never achieves a clear knowledge of itself unless it has first looked upon God's face and then descends from contemplating him to scrutinize itself. So the Bible's view of what humanity is, it's all bound up in this view that God has made us in his image. So uh, whenever you have any great empire, uh, you have uh, uh, different outposts that express the authority of the king or queen or emperor, and there will be an image of that person's face or, or, or something similar to, to say, this is who is in charge in this place. So if you go to uh, an embassy around the world, uh, you will see uh, portraits of that nation's king or president or whatever it is. If you go to a British army base or, or an, an officer's mess on some nuclear submarine in the middle of the ocean, uh, in there, there will be a portrait of the queen, an image saying, here's who's in charge. Here's whose values we subscribe to. This is whose orders are followed in this place. And so we are created in the image of God. It doesn't mean that we, we look just like him. It doesn't mean that's that God has necessarily has two arms and two legs or, or anything like that. It is that, that we are created to be uh, a picture of his character here on earth. So here's, how the, uh, here's from the uh, creation account. This is Genesis chapter 1, starting at verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the grounds. And then skipping ahead to verse 31. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Man is far more than a highly developed animal or refined ape. He is as different from other creatures as animals are from vegetables. God has given human beings a unique and honoured place in the universe. We are his image. So you can pick that out in a few different ways just in this passage, can't you? Uh, God says, let us make man in, in our own image. So God is community. And we looked at the Trinity last week. Uh, God is communal and he's created communal people. He created us in society. Uh, created us to depend on one another, to know one another, to value one another. It's one of the things that makes lockdown so difficult, isn't it? When uh, we are not able to enjoy that community in the close way that we are used to. He, he himself is diverse yet equal. Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are different from each other, and yet fully God. He created human beings, diverse, men and women, 
and yet equal. He made us expressive. The whole of chapter one is taken up with God saying one thing and another, and it is true. And he made us with the skills of language, and we uh, love to express ourselves to one another. Uh, we are creative, just as God is. And he made us as a steward to rule over on his behalf the, uh, the animals and the creation here in this world. It means it's not ours. It doesn't belong to us. We are looking after it for him. We are his image. We, we, we say that actually it is his values that uh, must be uh, lived out here on earth. Man became God's personal representative on earth with authority over all other living creatures. But humanity was also given a special dignity being created in his image uh, to look after, to care for, take responsibility for all the things that uh, God has made. Uh, we are spiritual, rational, moral, uh, and immortal beings with natures that were perfect. In other words, we were a true reflection of God's holy character. You also hear, see here implied in the fact that we are stewards, ruling over things uh, under him, so that we are obedient and accountable. That's how he made us. It's not always what we see now, but we are accountable to him. He made us. He has the right to hold us accountable for the way we use what he has given to us. Uh, but the way we were made is that we were gladly and consistently uh, glad to obey all, the, all of God's commands. And as a result, lived in, in perfect harmony with him. Uh, humanity had no identity crisis in the beginning. We knew who we were. There was no, there's nobody in the Garden of Eden painting Gauguin's picture and thinking, once I've done that, I might as well kill myself because there's nothing else to do. Um, no answer to those questions, where we came from and where we're going. Um, also, we see that uh, we are dependent creatures, uh, created to be in a relationship with him. It, we see him here in, uh, uh, in this passage providing food for Adam and Eve and uh, giving them jobs to do. Uh, but not only was uh, humanity uh, totally fulfilled and completely satisfied with uh, our position in the world. We also see that God was totally satisfied with humanity. We see verse 31, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was eve evening and morning the, the sixth day. So we are also loved. That's our natural condition. And uh, when people really struggle with not feeling loved or, or not knowing that uh, that, that love in their lives. That's because actually we are created to know the love of God himself and nothing lesser can ever really satisfy. We know all this because the Bible tells us that when his work of creation was complete with humanity as its crowning glory, just said those words of blessing, uh, enjoying it, enjoying humanity and all his creation, inviting us to enjoy it too, in relationship to him. At that point in history, we were perfect people in a perfect environment, enjoying a perfect relationship with each other and in perfect harmony with God. Well, obviously, that's not quite the situation we see uh, today, is it? And uh, next week, we'll explore uh, how uh, our first ancestors rebelled against our creator. And so the whole of creation is fractured as a result. But uh, I want us to see, just for now, what we should be, what we're created to be, what we're invited to be, what we're being called back to. Because there is a new theory of who we are, which has gained ascendancy over the last hundred years, that we exist by accidents, the self-evolved products of blind forces. And this is attractive to those who don't like the idea of being answerable to God. But it comes at a, at a colossal cost to our self-identity. When we consider us, ourselves without having first contemplated the face of God, it is catastrophic. We find ourselves no longer to be honoured creatures 
uh, stewarding God's world for him, but as accidental beings uh, whose only hope is to squabble over uh, diminishing resources. That's the whole idea behind survival of the fittest, isn't it? That, that, that resources are limited, and so we're in a constant competition with one another. And at the end of the 19th century, uh, we've seen that uh, Gauguin saw the, the void clearly, uh, as did Nietzsche. And uh, Darwin, uh, I, I don't think he means, meant to express something so horrific. But let me uh, read a quote uh, as to his view of humanity based on his theory, uh, his view of where humanity is going. He said, at some future periods, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races. At the same time, the anthropomorphous apes, as uh, Professor uh, Schaffelhausen has remarked, will no doubt be exterminated. The break will then be rendered wider, for it will intervene between man in a more civilized state, as we may hope, than the Caucasian uh, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of as at present between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. Now, it's absolutely horrific, isn't it? That he could say it and be a respectable Victorian gentleman when he wrote it is shocking to us now. And what makes it even more shocking is when we put that quote in the context of Darwin's life and values. He didn't hate people of other races. He was undoubtedly a white supremacist, but he didn't hate people of other races. He campaigned for a humane for foreign policy. He, he campaigned and gave significant amounts of his own money to uh, the campaign for the abolition of slavery. But clearly, he believed that uh, the extermination of other races was an inevitable part of progress. That's what his theory depends on, doesn't it? Uh, the uh, survival of the fittest and a species dividing into different breeds and the different breeds competing with one another and the stronger ones wiping out the weaker ones. And from his vantage point in history, he was convinced that that was uh, the future belonged to Europeans. When you don't believe in God, there are no human rights or duty anymore, only power or the lack of it. There's no real truth, only competing narratives, no heaven or hell, no final judgments, no accountability, just the scramble to get your own way in the here and now. And I think the mixture of those two ideas explains what we see on our news reports and in our history books. What is humanity? Have we been made by a loving God to know him and love him and love one another? Or are we here by accident? Just the, the ones that ma managed to uh, win out in the struggles to survive, stepping over uh, weak, weaker species to do so. And so progress and survival depends on doing the same in the future. But there's one more point that I need to make about humanity. We'll look at what went wrong and what we need to do to put that right in future weeks. But the important thing is that God still loves us. We considered that at the beginning in Psalm 8, didn't we? A, a, a psalm that uh, uh, delights in the fact that God is mindful of us, that he's given us such dignity, such a place in his creation. And the fact that we have messed up his creation has strained our relationship, but his love is constant towards us. He has not given up on us, and he has sent his son to save us and to restore this creation to be better than you. That's the thing that's so important about humanity, that God the Son took on humanity, became one of us in order to rescue us. He loves us, and we can know that love and care now. We're going to pause there uh, because we're going to watch a, a video, a recent testimony 
And uh, I thought it's just a lovely example of one man giving his experience of God's care for him in his needs. So uh, we're going to watch this. Uh, uh, this is Lee's story. Uh, when God sent a cleaner. There was two nights particularly in the hospital when I honestly didn't know whether I would make it or not. I was under incredible pressure. Got trips up and, and all that they needed to do. But I remember those nights particularly, really crying out to the Lord and, and asking Him to help me. And asking Him to even supernaturally just do something that would encourage me and, and bring me through. And I remember the next day, I had a night from hell. <laughs> and you got to understand this in, in the isolation ward. When no one else can get in, when no one else, no pastor, no friend, no family members, when no one else was allowed in, God sent a cleaner. And all of a sudden this cleaner had come in and he was like a ray of sunshine. And he began to chat to me and he asked me how I was. And he began to talk to me and say to me about about hanging in there. And then we got chatting and we got talking and he and he turned around and he, and, and he said to me that he was a missionary in Nigeria for 14 years. And he began to tell me how God had saved many, many souls through his ministry. And just this last couple of years, he had found himself back home in Northern Ireland and, and he's encouraging my heart. And he's telling me about souls and about the love of Jesus and the love of God. And I'm just sitting going, wow. When God needs to reach you, he knows exactly who is the right person. And in that moment of time, it was a cleaner. No one else could get in. God sent a cleaner. He left that day and then he says this as he stood at the door. He says, son, can I pray for you? I says, absolutely. And as he began to pray at the door, he couldn't touch me. <clears throat> as he began to pray at the door, he began to ask God the Holy Ghost to visit me. He began to ask God to heal my body and touch my lungs. He stood at that doorway and he pleaded with God Almighty to spur my life and to continue to use me. And then he left. And what was incredible was that after he left, <clears throat> he periodically would walk past my window and give me a thumbs up. That night, I remember, I started to turn around. Could it have been the prayer of a cleaner? That night I began to desire a packet of prawn cocktail crisps, Kato. And I asked the Lord, because no one could get to me. And I says, Lord, is it possible that you could get me a packet of prawn cocktail crisps and a tin of coke? Because that night I began to turn. The next morning, cleaner came. He brought in a bag. And in that bag, was two oranges, a tin of Coke, and a packet of prawn cocktail crisps. Who tell me that God doesn't know? God knows our every need. He knows every desire. And he just passed the bag through the door. He, he couldn't come in. And he just says, it's a gift from the Lord. I sat up. I had them crisps. 
God is a God, folks, who is personal. He knows the deepest desires of our hearts. He knows what we have need of. I want to encourage you out there today. God knows what you have need of. He knows your heart's desire. He is an incredible saviour. Never underestimate what God can do with you. I get to that cleaner. You know who you are if you ever see this. Thank you for hearing the voice of God and reaching someone like me. For you that are saved, keep your eyes upon him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And for you that doesn't know Jesus Christ, I would encourage you, lift up your eyes and look to heaven. And with a cry from your heart, say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner go home justified just as if you had never sinned may God bless you may you know the love of Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost what a saviour Amen Isn't that just a lovely testimony uh, just uh, sharing in, a, in his time of uh, greatest weakness just God answering prayer, uh, God sending someone to comfort him and, uh, and remind him of the Saviour. God loves us. He cares for you. Don't let anyone tell you that uh, you're just an accident, that, you're, you, you, that you don't matter. God loves The dignified thing we can say about humanity is God himself was not too much of a snob to become a human being. He didn't think it was beneath his dignity to become one of us. Guys, has uh, anyone got any questions for me? Do you know what that buzzing is? So, anybody want to ask any questions on this? Well, that's fine. So. We, uh, we contemplate God, we are made in his image. And when we know what he's like, and we realize that, we no longer need to be confused as to what we're worth, what other people are worth, what we're for, uh, our place in the world, what our gender is, uh, how to treat one another. Let's, uh, we're going to finish with a, a children's song. I knew there'd be some children here because they're mine. And uh, this is one that we love very much. Uh, j just the way God wanted us to be. So, uh, talking about God creating human beings, finding our place in Him. God made the earth and filled it full with seas and trees and animals, and then He made a man. But Adam, he was incomplete, so God gave him a helper. He carry out his plan this happy husband and his wife they showed the world what god is like until they disobeyed and even though they lost it all we still see fingerprints of god in everyone he makes we are the image of the god of all the world he made us made us girl different pieces of the puzzle we are just the way god wanted us to be we're shades of brown we're short and tall but god himself designed us all unique so we could see he wants each one to play a part to show the world the father's heart to have a we are the image of the God of all the world. He made us boy. He made us girl. Different pieces of the puzzle joined together perfectly. We are just the way God wanted us.
just the way God wanted us to be. Well, that's uh, a precious thing to remember, isn't it? Uh, human beings are very precious, made in the image of God. Well, next week, we'll have a look at what went wrong. And, uh, but for now, let me, uh, let me read the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Father, thank you that we've been able to look at this this evening. Thank you that uh, for some of us, at least, we just can be here together to look each other in the eye and uh, enjoy you together. Uh, dear Lord, would you bless us with the reminder that uh, it is you that has made us and not we ourselves. We listen to you to find out who we are and what we're for. And we pray that you bless us with that this week. You've prepared good things for us to do in this your world that you've given us to enjoy. And we pray that uh, we would uh, live lives this week that honour you and bless others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.